We had a week off, which was much needed. I know that a lot of us needed that week off. Um, it was actually a very short week. Um, but here we are. We're going to be on another long stretch of fights. Um, not the greatest card in the world, but a good card. It's going to be a fun card. Fun comeback card. Fun to get your feet wet again. Get your process going again. Because after a week, you take the time off. You relax, you start falling out of the repetitions of the routine, and then you get back into it. And it's nice to have a card like this, where a lot of the fights are, are kind of equally matched. Not a lot of really blowout fights, blowout lines. There's a couple. You're going to have them from card to card. But it's a, it's a fun card. This will be a fun introduction card back into another long run with some amazing fights that we have coming in the next couple months. From, from MMA to boxing to... Just so many, so many things. Before we jump into it, though, I do want to cover the fight between um, Canelo Alvarez and Jermel Charlo. Uh, if you guys watched my previous video, I said that um, I picked Canelo by decision, but I said that if there was going to be a situation to, to play, you probably would want to take a dog shot, sprinkle a little bit of money on Jermel Charlo. And boy, was I wrong. Um, I don't think that his skill set matched the performance in the ring on that night. Um, I am under the firm assumption now that this was a complete money grab for him. Um, he didn't look like he wanted to be there. He did not look like he cared. Uh, in the corner, he looked defeated. He looked defeated when he was coming to the ring. There's a lot of things you could look for uh, during the build-up to a fight, during the weigh-ins, during the walk during in between rounds if you could really see if a guy really truly wants to be there or if he's there for a multitude of different reasons um jamel charlo looked like he was there just to be there to get a quick payday he did not really look like he was dialed into the fight tuned into the fight he didn't fight the way he normally fights he was fighting scared he was fighting off his back foot the entire fight so i was not impressed by his performance at all and this is why sometimes when you do these long breakdowns and stuff like that, it's just, it's like, what, okay, well, you're not fighting the way you fight. This is not your fight. So it was a very odd fight. However, the big controversy afterwards, and this is, guys, this is why when you, like, see, I don't really intertwine with Twitter too much, and I don't intertwine with people on Twitter too much, because it's like, there's, there's mental mentality levels here, and then there's mentality levels here. And that's not me shitting on anybody, because listen, it's like me going into um, volleyball or golf. Golf, perfect example, golf. I know nothing about golf, zero. I can only name like the big names in golf, and I don't even know if they play anymore. I have no interest in golf. Um, I, I would once in a while watch maybe golf if I'm laying on the couch and it's a fall day. The, the voice will put you to sleep, you know, on a nice day when you're taking a nap, like... That's, that's my extent of golf. But social media has turned out to be a group of professionals. And I have to step away from it because if I don't step away from it sometimes, I will just start lambasting people. That's why I don't affiliate with a lot of the content providers in, in mixed martial arts, in boxing, in football. Like, I just kind of stay away from it because it's some of the things that's, that are said, some of them make sense. There's some guys out there that will say things that I'm like, dude, I'll make sense. And boom, I like it. But other times it's like they really just have, it's almost like they just want to hear their self talk. It's almost like listening to Michael Rappaport, right? It's like who listens to Michael Rappaport for sports? The guy knows Nothing about sports, but people, they have them on ESPN. It's like, it's ridiculous. So the big controversy in that fight was um, Bloody Elbow, which I wouldn't take their boxing credentials for, for dust, said, um, and it was a question. And I know it was clickbait. I know it was clickbait. I know 100% it was clickbait. But the question was, is Canelo Alvarez the, be the best Mexican boxer of all time? And when I tell you, I said, before I click on these comments, I need to prepare myself. Like, I really need to prepare myself for what I'm about to see. Because I see it in MMA. I see it in boxing. I see it in football. I see it in politics. I see it in everything. Like, just the most maniacal answers. Be prepared for this. And I was already, uh, uh, like, a little pissed off because of the fight. Like, I was like, I can't believe that was the fight. Like, I thought it was going to be a competitive fight. So I was already, like, aggravated. So lo and behold, when I click comments, there was a thousand comments in there and it was all yes. 
He's the best Mexican boxer of all time. Now, that might be one of the most ludicrous statements I've ever, ever heard in my life when it came to modern day sports. Like to even even ad, even say that. It's almost as ludicrous as saying Mike Tyson's the best heavyweight of all time. It's it's up there with that. It's very, very up there with that. So the only thing I said, I saw the first comment. I saw the very, very first comment. And he said, yes, this and that, 1,000%. Anybody who thinks otherwise is delusional. That's what they said. So I just commented and I said, I guess you weren't alive for Julio Cesar Chavez. Uh, and I said, LOL. And that was it. I woke up the next day. I must have had 100 comments on that thing. I mean, literally, it was ridiculous how many comments that I had on that thing. With some people agreeing with me. And you could see the people that were agreeing with me, they were of the older error they understood boxing the people that didn't agree with me were like the younger the younger generation like the today's the people who thinks tyson is like the best heavyweight of all time and they were saying and i so all i did was come back and i gave them some stats of who he's fought how many titles he's won 87 title defenses or you know, 87 fights in a row the most title defenses in history this and that blah, blah, blah. Uh, and they came back with 87 fight win streak against nothing but bums. Like this is this is what you deal with today. You deal with these minds that as long as you have a telephone, as long as you have a computer, as long as you have access to the world on the interwebs, you can say whatever the fuck you want. You could be whatever you want. You can be a fight analyst. You could be a football analyst. You can be an underwater basket weaving analyst. You could be whatever you want. In this in this world today, you could be the president of the United States on Twitter if you want to. So I have I have took I t- took a step back this week. I was like, you know what? I can't do this. Not this week. It's my week off. I'm not going to get into these these Twitter wars with these people. Um, I just got to like learn to just step back and ignore them, laugh at it, and ignore them. But anybody who thinks that Canelo Alvarez is better or will ever be better. Or could hold a candle to Julio Cesar Chavez is out of their minds. If you guys only knew how good that guy was, it doesn't matter that he, okay, there's, the, the, you know what, they're names you've never heard of. Like, that's what these people don't understand. They're names that they've never heard of. So that means it does, there's no relevance to them. Like, and I get that. Like, I get that. Like, if I were, if I come in, I've never watched UFC before, right? I've never watched MMA before. And all I know from back in the day is Fedor Emelianenko. That's all I know from back in the day. Like, that was the name, Fedor, right? And then all of a sudden, after 10, 15 years, I'm like, you know, I'm going to watch it again. And Fedor comes out of retirement, and Fedor fights, you know, Francis, or Fedor fights, you know, a, a heavyweight. I'm going to be like, I never heard of this fucking guy. Francis, I mean, I, I, Fedor, Fedor's going to win. I never heard of that guy. So that's where it stems from. You know, but... Boxing is the only sport, and I'm going to tell you this a hundred times. I will say this till I'm blue in the face, and I'm going to tell you this right now. My father is coming into California next week. He will be in studio with me, and I already told him because he couldn't believe what I was telling him. I already told him we're going to have a conversation about this. We're going to have a full-blown conversation. He's going to be next to me in the studio, and we're going to have a conversation about the fighters of yesterday to the fighters of today and the difference. And if anybody's going to drop knowledge on you, it's going to be him. This is a guy who literally lived in a ring his entire life. He brought me up in the ring. The guy knows everything, the history of boxing. Like He's, he's a, a, a very wise mid-70-year-old man. Little, not big, so I don't expect to see this big guy. He's like this little short guy. He looks like Mario Brothers. But this guy knows boxing like the back. He's seen it all. He's seen from back in the day, and he watched it evolve because he's never stopped watching it. He's always, you know, he saw the evolution. And there's, there's, there's not even a shot. There's not even a chance that the boxers of today can hold a candle to the boxers of yesterday. It's the one sport. In football, they get better. They get bigger, faster, stronger. In MMA, they evolve. Um, in baseball, you know, the technology is, is um, you know, the, uh, the speed, the, the speed and conditioning, everything, soccer, like everything gets... The only sport that will never be better, well, not, I'm not going to say never, but as of right now, we couldn't hold a candle to the yesteryears is boxing. 
you're not getting no more Sugar Ray Leonard's. You're not getting no more Durans. You're not getting no more Sugar Ray Robinsons. You're not getting any more Muhammad Ali's. You're not getting any more Joe Lewis's, Rocky Marciano's. Like you're not getting any more, you know, Salvador's, uh, Chavez's, um, you know, Pee Wee Pernell Whitaker's. You're not getting any more of those guys today. Not right now. Not right now. You're not getting those guys. So, like, anybody who's listening to this that's, like, a boxing fan or into boxing or, I mean, just, let's put it this way. People who say Mike Tyson was the best, okay? Mike Tyson wouldn't even be in a top bracket of the best heavyweights of all time. I can name heavyweights right now that would blow him out of the water, okay? First of all, Vander Holyfield beat him, so that's that's one guy right there, and I don't even rank, rank him in the top five, but he's one of my favorite fighters, um, Evander Holyfield, Rick Bowen, his prime would beat him. And now I'm working from here to here. I'm not even going all the way back yet. Riddick Bowen, his prime would absolutely beat Mike Tyson. He never fought David Tua. David Tua wasn't even good, but David Tua had his style. He never fought Ray Mercer. Ray Mercer really wasn't that good, but he had his style. So you can't even say that because he didn't even, he didn't even fight everybody like in his era. He fought a lot of the guys, but they were shipping him off to Tokyo. He was fighting Francis Botha, Tony Tubbs. Um, Frank Bruno, he was fighting, if anybody fought no-name fighters, it was Mike Tyson. He fought a washed-up Leon Sp- uh, Sp- uh, uh, Spinks. He fought a washed-up Larry Holmes. Like, who do you fight, Bone Crusher Smith? Peter McNeely? Like, he fought nobody. Anybody who was worth of anything that Mike Tyson fought, Mike Tyson lost to. You know, and don't say it was the Robin Givens thing. It was this. He fought nobody. Mike Tyson fought nobody. He might have fought, he might be the one guy in that tier that really fought nobody, but you're going to rank him as the best of all time, but you're going to say Julio Cesar Chavez isn't one of the best of all time. Are you out of your minds? Like you got to be out of your mind. So you were going to talk about like Mike Tyson. Okay. Who, who can Mike, who can't Mike Tyson beat? He would never beat Muhammad Ali. He would never beat George Foreman. He would never beat Larry Holmes in his prime. He beat him when he wasn't in his prime, in his prime. George Foreman came back to the heavyweight division, won the belt at 40 years old. He was, he was smoking people. Okay, so like these guys, even guys like Ernie Shavers, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, like the, the, the Tyson wouldn't hold a candle to these guys. Joe, Joe Frazier alone, smoking Joe Frazier alone would put an absolute clinic on Mike Tyson in his prime. An absolute clinic. And I'm saying this, obviously, you can see with conviction. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's what I mean when, when you talk sports with people, any sports, like just be mindful on who you talk to because you will age yourself. And I've learned after this week, like, now I know why, like, I kind of keep my arms over here. Like, I'm just like, all right, listen, you can have your opinion, but it doesn't mean I got to listen to it because you're wait- it's just wasting my time. You know, so that was one of the most maniacal things I've heard all week. I, I mean, for no, not all week, in a while, that Julio Cesar Chavez wasn't one of the best of all time and he fought all scrubs. So take that for what you will. Anyway, we're here for a fight card, guys. And we're about to break that down. So like I said, not a bad card, decent card, a fun card. You got Grant Dawson, Bobby Green in the main event. This is a fight, I got to be honest with you, that I'm a little bit concerned for, for Grant Dawson. I, I, I will tell you right out of the gate, I am picking him to win this fight. Um, but this is a very big test for him. And I think Bobby Green is a big test for anybody. It doesn't matter his record. It doesn't matter how... Um, you know, uh, how many wins, how many losses he has. It's his style that's very tricky. And even though he is getting a little bit older and he's on the wrong side wrong side of 30, the guy still has a wherewithal to really get into these certain situations and to find these certain angles and to find these certain nuances to make things difficult. He knows how to make things difficult. You know what I mean? Um, he, he does that whole shoulder roll thing and, you know, the, the whole Philly shell, which... You know, obviously we saw that it works for Sean Strickland. It works for Bobby Green. Bobby Green is still very hittable, though, where Sean Strickland actually uses that Philly shell more defensively when Bobby Green, to me, seems like he uses a little bit more for showiness. You know what I mean? He's not using it to be so effective. It's more for, you know, showboating, where Sean Strickland's not showboating. He's actually using it for a form of, you know, ricocheting off his shoulder, taking away his target, and stuff like that. But Bobby Green is a very difficult riddle to solve. Um, and if you don't, if you don't really get out of the gate early with him and start to figure him out, that's when he starts kind of losing you a little bit. And then he starts not playing with his food because he's not, he's not looking at you in that way. Like you're just, you know, I'm going to play, I'm going to toy with you, but that's when he could really start, really starting to feel himself. And once he starts to feel himself and he gets into that, 
that rhythm, that's when it's hard to kind of slow him down. So you got to kind of chop him down right out of the gate. You got to cut off his angles, cut off his corners, you know, kind of put him on his back foot and make him start thinking, make him start fighting defensively, make him start fighting um, in, in, a, in a more cautious manner. Because once he starts getting into that flow state, he doesn't really care. He finds his range. He keeps you on the outside. He starts tagging you. Uh, he does have very good defensive wrestling um, that he doesn't use that often because he does like to stand and trade on the feet. Um, Dawson on the other side, this is a kid, man, who, who continues to impress me. Like, he really, really does. He continues to impress me. He's got very good grappling. He's got a, a, a very um, hard pressure wrestling game to get you to the ground. His striking is starting to get a little bit better. That's where he's really deficient in the beginning when I saw his striking was just a little off. Um, but it is getting better, but he makes his money with his wrestling and his grappling. Um, the thing that concerns me for him here is not only the rhythm of Bobby Green, but it's also going to be the five rounds. Um, he's never been five rounds before. This is his first like big spot. So how is he going to handle that? We really don't know. He looks like he's got really good conditioning. This kid knows how to put on a pace, put on a pace, put on a pace. But we haven't really seen him in a five-round fight, putting on that pace. We haven't seen him really super confused. He's always been really kind of the nail, right? Like, Grant Dawson's always been kind of the nail. Uh, Bobby Green can kind of flip that table on him and start beating the hammer a little bit. Not that he's going to start pinging him away, but he can cause damage. If you look at Grant Dawson, you just look at his structure, uh, he does have, like, some serious scar tissue uh, build up where, you know, Bobby Green can start cutting him up, and that can really give a little bit of a scenic painting to the judges. Like, all right, well, this is a close fight, but look at his face, look at his face. Bobby Green really doesn't cut all that much. Dawson's got a lot of scar tissue. You could just tell in his face. You don't even have to see him fight. You just tell in his face that he does have that scar tissue, that he does tend to cut. Some people tend to cut. Guys like the Bayonne Bleeder, Chuck Weppner. This guy cut and cut. You could go like that, and he would cut. Grant Dawson's a guy who cuts. So when you're going to the cards and it's a close fight or it's a close round, the round ends and he's got blood coming down here and Bobby Green looks the rest of the day as he, they may, you know, that that's a little bit of a, you know, so things can get a little hairy in this fight. I'm not expecting them to. I'm expect. I mean, I'm not expecting Grant Dawson to lose this fight. I do think he wins, but I do think there is a major danger zone for him in this fight. And there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. So I'm going to pick Grant Dawson tentatively in this fight. But I do think that he is absolutely 100% live. Bobby Green is in this fight. Uh, next fight, we got Joe Pfeiffer and A.R. Wright. This is an interesting fight. Now, you know, there's there's not many people um, in the UFC or MMA or boxing that I, that I don't like. There are like a handful of people that I don't like. Um, and obviously, if you guys watch the show enough or you, you're a subscriber of mine, you know who they are. But I wouldn't say I don't like Joe Pfeiffer. Because I do. I think, you know, the kid, I, I respect the kid for what he does. I res Obviously, I respect all fighters. You know, he's a Philly kid. He's right next door to, you know, uh, to me and Bush. Me and him were, you know, New Jersey, New York kids. You know, the only thing I don't like about him and the only thing I don't like about some of these people that do this, I should say, is, you know, if, if you've been around the fight game for a long time, right? If you've been around for the fight game for a long time, you know that the majority of these guys, the majority of them, come from poverty-stricken backgrounds. Majority of them. There are your handfuls. There, there's guys that know. They come from, you know. But a lot of these guys from where I'm from, like, you know, me and Bush, we're from the Patterson, New Jersey area. They made movies about our area. The movie Lean on Me, um, you know, uh, Denzel Washington, Hurricane. Like, that's all about Patterson, New Jersey. Like, where we're from, the guys who fight, when I used to go to the boxing gyms in Patterson and stuff, like... We were all poor. We were all fucking poor. You know what I mean? Like, I'll tell you this right now. I ain't afraid to say this. And this is the first time I'm saying this. And I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this because of... Um, uh, um, I'm not saying this to, to, to compare myself with anybody. I'm just proving a point here. And because you, you've never heard me talk about it. Okay? But when I was a young, young kid, when, I, when my parents first got divorced, shit, man, my mother was on fucking... We were kids from Patterson. My mother was on welfare. You don't hear me talking about, hey, you know, I grew up. And I, that To me, that doesn't mean nothing. I grew up with guys that were poor. I came from a poor area. You know what I mean? Like, like just because you're, you, you were poor and you, you slept in a basement, like, I respect you. I respect that you didn't turn into be a drug addict or you didn't do this. But, but it, that's, a, that's a million people's stories. 
That's a million people's stories in sports and fighting and stuff like like you're no different. So like why like the media is jumping on this 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 Joe Pfeiffer story and everything. I get it. Like I I understand it. I can sympathize with it because I come from it. But that's a million people's stories. He's not like some anomaly that's like oh my god he's the only one. You know, so like, I, like take that and throw that out the window. Like, I came from nothing. You know, I'm here. I came. I saw his interview. I came from nothing. Three quarters of us from my area came from nothing. Like, we came from fucking nothing. But you don't hear us talking about it. We were in the streets all night long. I mean, literally all night long. When they tell you, like, back in the day, if you wanted to fight somebody in the street, they used to go to like East Side Park, or used to, they used to find like a cul-de-sac somewhere, and they used to neck up the fucking cars and used to used to used to throw down. You know, so it's like, <clears throat> I, I don't like hearing that. Like, I, I we hear it from football players. We hear it from everybody. We hear it from that fucking The Rock, that $7 story, which is complete bullshit, by the way. But it's like, all right, I get it. You came from nothing. I I, I understand. But, like, why do you got to keep bringing it up? Like, I don't like that. Like, I don't like that. Like, like okay, say it once when your, when your bio comes out, when your story comes out. Yeah, but it's like every interview. I came from nothing. I came from nothing. I came from nothing. It's just... Doesn't make sense to me. As a fighter, I think he's good. I think he's a good fighter. I think he's a little overrated by by the by the public. I think what happens with with fighters sometimes is they get these quick knockouts and they um, um they get these quick finishes and like people are really quick on jumping onto them, which is okay. Like he's he's showing good stuff. Like Joe Pfeiffer's a tough kid. He's from Philly. He's got a good camp behind him. Um, he seems like he's got some leather skin behind him. Not much really bothers him. So I do like that about him. Um, you know, but I, I, I will tell you this. If he thinks... I, I, I did like his interview. I will tell you that. I did like his interview outside of the whole I came from nothing thing. He was a little bit more respectful to the fighters than he usually is. Usually he's talking shit and yelling shit and fuck this one and fuck... This time he was very respectful of AI. He, he he acknowledged like this guy can knock me out. This guy can absolutely beat me. He's a tough guy. Um, you know, he does, you know, tend to gas out. Like he brought up some very valid points. Nothing was invalid. And he said, like, you this guy can absolutely one thousand percent knock me out. It's a dangerous fight. I like that. I, I like that. I don't like guys coming out to the podium going, ah, my ankle do shit to me. I don't like that. Pfeiffer actually handled the interview really, really well. And I like where his mind is. I like where his mind, what his future is. I like where his mind is setting up for a house and doing all these things. Like, he's got some really good mindsets, you know, mindsets. I just wish he would throw that whole, I came from nothing bit out of the, out of, out of the garbage. You know, um, but ARA is a guy who is 1,000%. He's correct. He is dangerous. But ARA is going to be dangerous for about one round. And then after that round, Pfeiffer is going to be able to kind of do what he wants. Um, ARA is a black belt in judo. He's a judo practitioner, but he never really uses it. This guy fell in love with his power, and he fell in love with his power in a big, big way. Um, so his judo is really not anything that you're going to be like, oh, my God, he's, you know. I got to watch for the throws. He will do them once in a while. You know, if you're really locked up close quarters with him and he does have it, if you're clinched up against the cage and he can find one, he will throw you. But he's it's not his game. His game is he wants to stand, he wants to slang and bang. And when he does that, he loads up on everything. And he's got about five minutes. You know, and those five minutes are going to be chaos. Those five minutes are going to be dangerous. Because if he does hit you, he does hit like a ton of bricks. He will 1,000% knock Pfeiffer out if he catches him. But after that five minutes, I think that's when Pfeiffer can just start taking this fight over. He can take him down, grapple with him. Once ARA is on his back, he doesn't really have much. Um, and that's what I think he wants to do. I think he wants to weigh on him. You know, he really wants to just weigh on him uh, and start taking that, you know, build that lactic ass up, up in ARA's muscles, get him tired, let him carry your weight, gas him out, take that power away, make his arms heavy, and then start taking your way with him. So I am going to pick Pfeiffer. I don't think this fight goes to the cards. I think it's either going to be ARA knocking him out early or, you know, or, or Pfeiffer uh, finishing him late. But I am officially pick. I'm going to go with uh, Joe Pfeiffer. Next fight, um, Alex Morono <clears throat> and Joaquin Buckley. <clears throat> this is actually a good fight. You know, Joaquin Buckley, Buckley's grown on me a little bit. I didn't like him coming in. You know, uh, initially, I wasn't really a huge fan of him just for the mere fact that... Um, I didn't like his attitude. Like, I'm big on attitude. I'm big on um, being humble. I'm big on just, you know, being well-spoken. 
presenting yourself the right way, representing your company the right way. Like I'm big on all those things. And to me, he just seemed like, like he was like just some guy in the division running around. You'll see him on camera calling people out for fights and stuff like that. Um, but I got to say, he has grown on me. He seems like he has matured. Same thing with Kutalaba. Kutalaba, I'm actually really impressed, you know, how he's matured as well. Like, both of these guys are kind of coming into their own. He looks like he's in phenomenal shape. Uh, he looks like he's taking this camp very, very seriously. But the problem is, you know, you could take things very seriously and you can have a great camp and you'll be completely focused and dialed in and a great athlete. But if you don't have the chops really behind you, then, then it's, 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 a, it's a tall task, you know? And here's the thing. These guys are so different, him and Morono. You got a guy in Buckley who's a great athlete, super explosive. He's got good power. He's got good hands, um, dynamic. And then you, but he's not really fundamentally sound, right? <clears throat> doesn't have all, doesn't check all the boxes for technique and fundamentals and stuff like that. Then you get a guy in Alex Morono who is the opposite. He checks all the fundamentals. He's got really good grappling. He's got very off-kilter striking, even though it's not fundamental. He's got a, a good technique about him. His game is very a good technical game. He's got a good technical. He's durable. He's got good cardio. He's got a good pace. Um, he's very intelligent, so he's got good uh, cage IQ. But he's not athletic. He's not super explosive. He doesn't have like this this this. Um, off the chain dynamic they're like two different guys so you're looking at dynamics versus technique which do you like more you know so you know this was a tough one for me because i know that morono can be caught i know that buckley can knock anybody out i don't care how durable you are he you know he's got a way about him that he can catch you sleeping you know and put you to sleep um but i got i'm going morono i, I have a funny feeling about this fight i'm going alex morono here um i just think that it, it, the, it, I think that what's going to give Buckley problems is how goofy foot Morono is. You know, you don't always have to be the best fighter. You can be this, like there's a lot of times these guys come in from the regional circuit and they're all over the place and they're a really good fighter. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? Like I've never seen, what the hell's going on? I can't get my timing down. Alex Morono doesn't allow you really to get your timing down. When you're fighting a traditional stance, a traditional fighter, or just like a normal, just like soup to nuts, fundamentally sound striker, like you could not read their patterns, but you could kind of read their body. You know, this is, I've seen this in the gym a hundred times. Like this is just fundamental technique boxing, you know, but when you get a guy who's like all over the place like him, and he's very like, it almost looks like he's jumping up and down. It's not even like he's going this way. It's like he does this. He like jumps on his feet. And it's very odd. You can't pin a guy like that down. Like, you can't get your timing on a guy like that. It takes time. And when it when things take time for Buckley, Buckley will start getting a little tired. I don't think that Buckley's going to gas this fight. I don't. I think he's going to slow down. But I don't think he's going to gas. If he doesn't knock Morono out, I think he's in good enough shape now where he's not going to gas. But at the end of the day, he still does carry a lot of muscle. He's still... Those, those hands are going to start coming down from the lactic acid in the shoulders. And the, I know I got big arms. I got big shoulders. So when I'm sparring and stuff like that, like you'll, you'll see me shaking my hands out. You'll see me shaking my arms out because after a while, it's hard to hold those hands up. You know, so <clears throat> when you're a guy like Morono that doesn't have a lot of muscle mass, you can keep them hands up all day. You know, so um, I'm going to go Morono here. <clears throat> Not a ton of confidence. Um, but I, I, um, I think that he either wins a, a, a pretty close decision. I can see Buckley winning round one, round two being close, and then kind of Morono just starting to piece him up in, in, in round three, um, or maybe taking him down and, 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 and grappling him a little bit, not letting him up. Or I see a possible finish for Morono late. So that's, uh, that's going to be an interesting fight. I'm looking forward to that one. Next one, Drew Dober, Rick Len. Another fight I'm looking forward to, um, I think Drew Dober rolls him here. I mean, I'm not going to... I think Rick Lynn is super, super tough. I do. I think he's a super tough guy. Um, I call him the, the, the gladiator version of Joe Dirt. Um, but there's a, just a, a matchup for him I don't like. It's just a matchup thing for him I don't like. You need a certain form of power and a certain form of imposement when you fight a guy like Drew Dober. You can't just expect to dance around him and ping, ping, ping and tag him. You need a, a certain, like, sh man, sh man strength about you. You know, he's got big legs. He's big. He's strong. He's got a chin like a pit bull. 
like super durable, even though it's starting to kink a little bit. We actually know he got knocked out. And Rick Lynn is just like a long fighter who like is wiry. He's got some good pop in his shots. He's got decent grappling. Like it's a very well-rounded fighter. But when push comes to shove, if Jude Dober wants to sit on his chin and just say, screw this, I'm going to move forward. We're going to slang. He's going to get the better of the exchanges. Like I don't see Rick Lynn big brothering Drew Dober anytime soon. Uh, and that's where it stands for me. It's you got a better chin. You're you, you're not going to get knocked out by Rick Lynn. Um, you know you're not going to get big brothered by him. You got more power. You got better leg kicks. You're just an overall better athlete. Like it's just everything's pointing towards Dober. So I'm going to go Dober. I just don't know if he's going to knock him out. Rick Lynn is is a pretty tough dude. Um, I'm just going to take just say Drew Dober. I wouldn't be shocked if he did it inside the distance. I also wouldn't be shocked um, if it went to the cards. But I will say I am leaning inside the distance. I think he has something to prove here. I think he wants to come in and make a statement after his last fight. Um, then the last one on the main card is um, Alexander Hernandez versus Bill Algio. This one is funny for me because both of these guys coming out, before they came out, I was super, super high on. Um, and for two reasons. One was Alexander Hernandez. I was watching him on the regional circuit for a long time, and I always liked him. I said, there's something about this kid. He's got good athletic ability. He's very explosive. But the most important thing to me always is how intelligent you are. I like to deal with people that are intelligent. I like to, because I know they can, they can absorb what I'm saying, and they can kind of transfer it in their own way. When you're dealing with somebody that has that kind of roadblock up mentally, it's hard. Like, it's hard to really make them understand, like, this is what we're going to do, and this is how you're going to implore it. And even when you do do that, when they're on the fly, when they're in, they're not sharp thinkers, they're not quick thinkers, you got to think on the fly. I could teach you a, a variation to an arm bar, or I could teach you a variation to a boxing combination 50 times until you're blue in the face. But once you get in there, if you don't see the opening, you're like, up oh, here it is, and bump, 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 and start throwing, it's pointless. It becomes <coughs> repetitive at that point. It becomes stagnant and nothing, and you forget that's why, like, when we talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu now, and I talk about the belt systems and how they're, it's watered down, it's like, I don't care if you're a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It, that doesn't mean anything to me because 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you are, like, a master at your craft, unless you, like, have not done it in the gym 1,000 times, 1,000 times, 1, 000, but I'm saying in a real situation, when your fucking heart is racing and you got something on the line, whether it's your a belt, whether it's money, whether it's being injured, whether it's being embarrassed in front of a crowd, whatever the case is, your memory goes out the window like that. Not everybody just says, all right, man, I know I'm going to do this and I'm going to take you down. I'm going to guillotine you and I'm going to do this. No, that's not the way it works. I can show you a thousand people out there that train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and train in Karate and train in Judo and train in this and train in that that their mind just goes whoop when the situation arises. You know what I mean? So with Alexander Hernandez and, and like people like Algio who are intelligent, these guys, you could get them. To, uh, do they have that string in their body? You know, that, that they're not going to get adrenaline dump and their heart's not going to race and they're not going to kind of forget everything. That's yet to be, that, that, that's, I, that's something I can't fix. It's something you can't fix. That's something that's wired with you. Or it's not. Stage fright. It's like a great singer, right? You get some of these people that can sing fantastic. Some people that can play the guitar fantastic. And then they step on stage and it sounds like they're in kindergarten. Happened to me. Happened to me one time. When I was, the first time I ever played out. First time I ever played out. I was like 21 years old. I wasn't expecting a lot of people to be there. We were in a place in New York. And I remember I was like, holy shit. And I got up there. And I remember it took me like a half of a song. Because I was the youngest guy in the band. I took me like a half of a song to really catch fire on, on playing. And then after the song was over, I was like, fucking bam, bam. And I was jamming. I, I felt like I was playing in my basement. But, it's, you know, uh, th there is that adrenaline dump and there is that stage fright sometimes that you got to shake out. And some people can shake it off. Like me, I shook it off halfway through the so song. And some people could just never shake it off. It's almost like hunters. I know hunters that are great shots. We go skeet shoot and they're great shots. Okay, maybe their first or second shot, you're like, oof, that was bad but then all of a sudden they get their rhythm and boom 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 and, they, and they're fine again okay or there's some guys that the skeets go up and they they just they you're there there's two other people there they're nervous they're usually doing it by themselves and they can't shoot or they go out to the field the next day for deer and they get buck fever and their their hand is shaking and they just can't pull the trigger some people get over it some people don't 
you know, so um, that you can't decipher. But to give them the information that they need, you got to be intelligent. And Alexander Hernandez is an intelligent kid. Like you just tell by his interviews, he's a very intelligent kid. So that's why when he came out, I was like, you know what? There's something about this kid. I think he, he has a chance to beat Darius. And he did. He ended up knocking him out. And I remember the guys over at our site, the MadLabMMA.com, we all, I think we, I, I, there wasn't a tournament that I saw that one of our guys wasn't on the top because of that. Because everybody was on Darius. Um, so I was high on him. But he has underachieved big time. This kid has all the talent in the world. He's got all the athletic ability in the world. He's got all the, all the tools. I think he just needs to really hop around to different camps and see what really suits him. I think he needs somebody to really taper in his, his skill set. He breaks under pressure. His cardio isn't there. There's so many things you can fix on that kid to make him good, but you're running out of time. Like this kid is not really a kid anymore. You know, he's been in some wars already. You know, so you got to get this kid now. Like somebody's got to grab this kid and just take a screwdriver and kind of fix these little things and tighten them up and see what you have. You know, because he does have talent. He does have potential. He does have a higher ceiling that he's showing. But he's just, he, he's like a broken toy right now. He's like a, a, an average broken toy. Like you get a, something in the mail and the packaging is awesome. Then you open it up and you're like, gosh. You know, so that's where he is right now. Bill Algy, on the other hand, I'm very familiar with him because I used to call his fights for Ring of Combat. I called his fights numerous times for Ring of Combat, and I always had my eye on this kid. Um, I didn't like his braggadocious personality back then, like, you know, in the cage and Senor Perfecto, and he always was the crowd favorite, you know, because it was a, more of a New York, New Jersey scene. Um, but the kid, I've, I've got to see him a couple times cage side while I was calling his fights, and the kid is fucking good. Like, the kid is really, really good. He doesn't do anything the same. You never really know what he's going to do, when he's going to do it next. There's no fight that is, is, is completely carbon copy. It's like you can kind of decipher what you think he's going to do that night. And he may, but he may also do something completely different. You know, he's just very unchained and very, and he's got a very controlled chaos about him. And that's what I like about him. The reason why I'm picking him in this fight when push comes to shove, he's not going to break. He's not going to take the back step. Alexander Hernandez is going to take the back step. He's proved it time and time again. Alexander Hernandez is a great hammer. He's durable. He's a tough kid. There's no doubt about it. But when push comes to shove, I haven't seen Algio break. I've seen him bend. I've seen him, you know, bend, bend, bend. I've never seen him break. Hernandez, I've seen him break, bend and break numerous times. So that's where it is to me. I, I think that he should be a bigger favorite in this spot, Algio. I think, I think you know, Hernandez has a lot to prove here. Like, this is a real proving ground fight for him. Uh, coming off a win, you know, this is, this is a fight that, you know, he wants to put a streak together, but I don't think it happens. I think Algio wins this fight. It's probably going to go to the cards. 29-28, 30-27, I'll give Hernandez... Maybe a round, maybe the first round, that, that whole that feel out process, because Algio kind of sticks to the outside and kind of sways you a little bit. And then he starts pursuing. It's he likes to get hit. Like he'll get hit. He needs to be cracked really to wake him up. Some of those fighters, you gotta fucking pop him to wake him up. So I'm gonna go Algio here. I think it'd be a good fight. Like I said, I wouldn't be shocked if Hernandez wins, because I know he has it within him. I know he has it within him to win. He's a good fight. He's he's got the potential to be good. I just can't. You got to show it to me. Like it's a t fight after fight after fight. You break. You break. You break. You break. How do I pick against? How do I take you against a guy who I've never seen break? Even on the regional circuit, I've never seen him break. So I'm gonna go Bill Algio here. I'll go Bill Algio by decision. Um, wouldn't be shocked if he finishes him like the third round though. If he can actually break him. Um, and that'll be a, uh, the Christine Showdown Dog Pick of the Week. I'm happy to say that we do align with Alice Morono. All right, so that'll be it. Uh, guys, go check out the MadLabMMA.com. We have some great stuff going on there right now. We just actually did a contest uh, last week. Yeah, we did a contest last week. We do all shit like this. We're going to be doing this a lot now. Um, I went out and I bought a, a boxes of, of, of trading cards. I got, you know, one guaranteed autograph, then a box of Don Ross, then a box of Select. And we run DraftKings tournaments for our subs. So you basically play to win a box. Like, you're obviously playing for the autograph box. 
but we got the other boxes for second and third. We do swag giveaways. We do so much. We Our Discord, by far, I'm not even saying this, and I know my guys watch this too, but by far, you will never see a better Discord. We just had this conversation in my Discord um, the other night, how we look at each other like friends and family. Like, nobody's talking shit to each other. Nobody. It's like a real brotherhood club. Like, so if you guys want to be a part of something really, really special, not overly huge, it's a nice condensed group of guys, you know, all mature, no one's out to get each other. doesn't matter what your level of knowledge is, whether it's here or here, we are always just helping each other out. Even when I'm not in there during the week because I'm doing all this stuff, I go in there and I peek and these guys are just giving each other props and helping each other with bets and it's just such a great community and we don't only have MMA now, we have NFL, we have the whole run pure sports playbook on our site now that they give us week to week we also have our currency cartel which is about six of us that give bets every week for nfl and our DraftKings. we have derek doing um contrarian corner we have me doing mad lab against the chalk um we i honestly i mean listen i could be biased but i've seen a lot of football content out there and a lot of it's not that good you know what i mean not that good a lot of content in general is not that good so we decided that we're going to pigeonhole our specialties. We're not going to go with all these sports, golf, baseball, this, that, bah, bah, bah. <coughs> we're going to go what we're good at. We are good at football and we are good at MMA, MMA in particular, obviously, because that's what we do. Um, but if you want all the content you can handle, um, a great time opportunity to win a bunch of things, you know, um, and just a, a, a good brotherhood. And we have women in there too. Uh, definitely come down to the Mad Lab of May, uh, dot com and just come check us out. You know, you know, you come for a week, you come for a month. If you like it, you can join for a year. Uh, but I guarantee you, if you go in there for just one week, you will be hooked and you will end up staying. I'll talk to you soon.